Hi, I'm Patrick. Um, the subject of my talk was creative process and thinking. Um, I alluded to three particular methods. Um, one was what if, the other was uh, say no consistently, and the other is sticking to the brief like glue. Having said all of those, I did say that there were no rules or methods involved. True creativity is chaos. Uh, it has to be practiced on a daily basis, and it requires you to be relentless, resourceful, and what was the third one? It was really good, whatever it was. Um, there you go, that's creativity in play. Thank you. Greetings. What can go wrong after an introduction like that, eh? Anyway, here I am. Um, Rothko started 23 years ago. Uh, myself and my business partner, Paul Hughes, were over in Saudi Arabia working for Saatchi and Saatchi when a client gave us a brief to help their uh, product at the time come closer to the front of the shelf. So Paul and myself began thinking about that and we uh, thought we had a good idea that we'd like to sell to somebody else. So we developed a, a spring-loaded drink dispensing system. So you know when you take the bottle of Coke out and one is pushed forward? You do know that, come on. That was us, 25 years ago. And we thought we were great, we thought we were made. Um, we got a contract with Coke in Atlanta uh, to do the research and development on it. And while we were going through all of that, now I was 23 at the time, Paul was 25. We weren't from manufacturing backgrounds. Uh, we didn't come from families with money, but we had this good idea, or so we thought. But we met up with some accountants to give us some financial advice. And their advice was, while you're waiting to become super wealthy from this idea with Coca-Cola, you should keep doing what you were doing which is ideas for advertising in our case. Uh, and that's what we did. As the drink dispensing system uh, was like that, Gravity Fed came in and the bottles slid down and Coke said, we're not going to use your spring loaded, we're gonna go Gravity Fed. So 23 years later, I'm really pleased that those accountants gave us that advice. Um, I tell you that story because after 23 years we sold the business to Accenture Interactive in January. We've always been an ideas agency, we're now an ideas tech business. I really don't know what that means yet, we're only seven months into the journey. But I thought one of the things I'd try to help with today was, you've perhaps seen this before, it's, uh, it's very well known, the design thinking process. As you can see, it's very well organised. You've got an inspiration stage, an ideation stage, and an implementation stage. And they all go backwards and forwards. It never ends. It's wonderful. If you happen to work in the chaos of a creative process, like an ideas agency or an advertising agency, that creative process looks a little bit more like this. <laughs> and that's technical, by the way. So the work begins, then you literally go away, then you panic, and most of the work is done while crying because you so self-doubt before the clients come back in the room. And the difference between the first process and the second process is just pure chaos. I find that some of the things in creativity bring a lot of snobbery with them. And I don't think that's appropriate because some of the stories that I'm gonna tell you here have different ways to find your way through creativity. And as you guys are in college, I think the most important uh, rule to remember is there are no rules when it comes to innovation and creativity. I mean, having done some talks for a while, that's the most genius piece of innovation ever because people backwards and forwards, and now we have a red button and a green button, so even I can work it out. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about three particular methods, and again, I'll debunk them at the end, but the first method is keep saying no. So when you're working on a creative project, it's a very difficult place to be, the one in the room that says no. Because mostly, when people work on creative projects, they tend to be very passionate about them. They bring a lot of emotion. There's largely going to be late nights and weekends involved in it. So when they bring the fruits of their labor back to a room to share with whoever they're working with, in a gang, in a college project, it takes a particular type of person to say, I don't think that's good enough, or I think we can do better. But after all these years, I can tell you that the people who say no are the ones that you need to listen to the most, because it does end up, in my experience, with the best work. The people who say yes the most, they might be lovely people, and they're trying to be kind, but the problem is the world will ignore your ideas. 
It's the ones that say no consistently until eventually you walk in and they say yes. So this happened with us during the marriage equality referendum. At the beginning of that year, we had made a decision that we wanted to get involved in the debate. We wanted to support the yes vote. Um, and we wanted to do something that we felt was meaningful. So we sent a brief out to the whole agency. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of gangs got together, different disciplines, started to work on what could Rothko do that was gonna help somebody to uh, persuade them to uh, vote yes. And it was gang after gang came into the room to show their ideas, discuss them, tell us why they thought they were gonna be uh, the idea that was going to get noticed. And we went through, I think at last count, it was something like 60 projects were rejected. 60 projects were rejected until this happened. And it was uh, a leaflet that came through my letterbox, actually, unfortunately, which had the most disgusting lies uh, about uh, homosexuality and gender and all, all the rest of it. I mean, it was really, really dreadful stuff. So I brought that into uh, the creatives the next day and said, that just came through my letterbox. Surely there's something we can do about this. So without further ado, I'll play the first uh, video, please. 18 months ago, Daintree Paper was forced to close down due to the owner at the time's anti-gay stance. The business was sold, but the new owners now had a pretty serious image problem. This is a story about how this little paper shop in Ireland restored their reputation and became a global phenomenon by recycling homophobic flyers into confetti to help support a yes vote in Ireland's recent marriage equality referendum. At Daintree, we believe in making beautiful things out of paper. So when paper was used to print some pretty ugly lies in the run-up to Ireland's marriage equality referendum, we wanted to do something about it. Shred of Decency is confetti made from 100% recycled lies. We collected any negative and dishonest flyers, leaflets and online literature and recycled them into something positive with all profits going to support marriage equality. We sold it on our nifty new website and over the counter in our little shop in Dublin. The results were exactly what you'd expect from an awards case film. Hundreds of articles and magazines, newspapers and websites all over the world. Hundreds and thousands of likes and shares and millions of social media impressions. So for your clever approach to advocating for equality ahead of Ireland's May 22nd same-sex marriage referendum, you, Daintree Paper, are our unicorn of the week. But the personal impact of the campaign was far more important than likes and shares, both for the people all over the world who shared their experiences, their love and their support for marriage equality, and for Daintree themselves, whose reputation was completely restored in the eyes of the public. Thousands of euro was raised for Yes Equality, and we're proud to say we helped take lies and hate out of the marriage equality debate. As for the most important result of all, on the 22nd of May, Ireland became the first country in the world to approve marriage equality by a popular vote with a landslide majority. Um, so, the keep saying no method is, is designed to get you the very best of your idea. Um, as I say, it takes, it takes a particular type of person to be the one to say no all the time. So if you are lucky enough to work with uh, or be in, in gangs working on projects with anybody who's willing to stand up for the standards, um, I would strongly recommend you listen to them. Um, method two, what if? Um, this is a commonplace method. Um, you, I hope, would all use it regularly. It's designed to be uh, iconoclastic. Um, any rules that are there, you should be breaking them. You should be questioning everything and anything. And the difficulty with commercial parameters in a what-if environment is clients normally have to give us a brief. But if you work in a truly creative environment or you try to create one, it means that people should have the freedom to come with ideas. Um, ideas that they don't know whether they're going to be able to do um, and it, or if anyone is going to be able to do in this particular case. Um, this is a piece of work that, uh, that we ran this year. Um, in, the in the first one there for Daintree Paper, clearly we had that idea and then went and found Daintree Paper as a client because they didn't give us the brief to go do it, but we thought the idea was way too good not to go and try to find somebody who has already had some problems in that area. In this second idea, we did exactly the same thing. I'll tell you the story after it. Uh, one of our creative, uh, or actually our executive creative uh, director came in to me and said that he was watching a JFK documentary the previous night. Um, they spoke about a, a speech that JFK did not deliver because it was on the day that he was assassinated. And he asked, 
is there anything we could do? Could we use artificial intelligence to get JFK to deliver the speech that he never delivered? So my instant reaction was yes. And then we called other people in who were way smarter than us and said, how do we go about doing that? Um, and it was a long journey of, uh, of how we went and did it. But uh, I'll, pl I'll play the video and then I'll tell you some more. On the 22nd of November, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated as his motorcade made its way to the Dallas trademark. This there has been an attempt on the life of President Kennedy. It is true. Our president has been shot. What if technology had advanced so much so as to allow JFK, on the centenary of his birth, to finally deliver the hugely important trademark speech? As part of the Times Find Your Voice campaign, we had to review 831 JFK speeches and interviews and create a database of 116,777 phonetic sound units split into 233,554 half phones. To blend small speech units together, it helps to have very consistent data. For JFK, this was a major challenge. It was almost as if each recording was in a different environment and of a different quality, so combinations of sounds were selected and smoothed together by months of painstaking sound engineering, allowing us to finally hear the trademark speech delivered in JFK's own voice. In a world of complex and continuing problems, in a world full of frustrations and irritations, America's leadership must be guided by the lights of learning and reason, or else those who confuse rhetoric with reality and the plausible with the possible will gain the popular ascendance with their seemingly swift and simple solutions to every world problem. We tracked down people who were waiting at the trademark that day and played it to them. We asked, therefore, that we... It gave me chills just to hear his voice again. Data usually sharpens a story, but for JFK, it made it possible to actually tell the story and allowed over one billion people to finally hear JFK unsilenced. Since the launch of JFK Unsilenced, this audio technique has been adopted by numerous companies around the world to help ALS sufferers refine their voice. So as a creative ideas agency, um, we have a privilege of being able to come up with ideas like this and then go find clients who might be able to use them. In this particular case, we spoke to uh, the JFK Library, uh, the JFK Museum, the JFK Family, um, I'm going to say eight, possibly nine other media outlets, and nobody, nobody would touch it. Why? Because it's very sensitive, uh, the speech itself, the content of the speech, if you uh, have the time to, to read it, you realize that the irony between when that speech was written and, um, and today's leadership, there's a big challenge in the speech, so nobody wanted to go, but we kept going. We kept going because, again, we thought the idea was too good to let go. I'll, I'll tell you the overall results for us as, a, as an agency at the end. Um, so they were two clients that we had to go and find. Then, of course, you have the other day job, which is when you work with a client that actually gives you a brief and pays you money to do something. So the creative thinking process there is very different. And a lot of the time, when you get a brief from a client, it is very difficult to see how you're going to reimagine the output of that. A lot of the time, that's why uh, particularly your generation are so difficult to reach because you ignore absolutely everything because there's so much out there, understandably so. And also you're listening and being influenced by different people. So the push media is very difficult. However, method number three, sticking uh, to the brief, asks you to follow exactly what was in the brief all the way through and keep on sticking to it. So what happens most of the time is you get halfway through the journey and you think you have it cracked. And to be honest, a lot of people stop there and the output is what you see and experience on a daily basis with communications, which is largely ignorable in my view. However, when you follow it all the way through and keep on asking, have we got the brief cracked? Have we got the brief cracked? You keep asking the same question, something special can happen. In this particular case, we work with a Heineken brand. Um, we've done a lot of the rugby stuff uh, for the last four or five years um, all around the world. This particular brief came from 
a strategic platform that we'd identified with and called Run With It. So when a rugby ball bounces, it can go that way or that way or that way or that way. And the logic here was that uh, Heineken um, drinkers are the type of people that when something happens socially, they can go with it. They'll take advantage of an opportunity that's in front of them and just do whatever happens uh, there. So that was the platform for this brief. And what the gang that were involved in it did was take that to a whole new level while sticking, in my view, to the brief. So they thought, let's think of something in rugby that a lot of people in this country know about. Then let's see just how far members of the public would be willing to go to go with it. And then even when we thought we've taken them to the, well, you'll see it, nauseating space, how far are they willing to take that? So this is a piece about Neil Back. Neil Back is a, a, an English rugby player, very famously um, in the Heineken Cup final. Uh, he's uh, in the scrum and he tapped the ball and he cost Munster the Heineken Cup final. Final whistle blew and he basically cheated. So what we did was we got Neil Back involved. Uh, we pretended that we'd accidentally leaked his mobile phone number on social media and we waited for the abuse to start. Oh, who did the abuse start? Uh, I'll play the video, you can judge for yourself. And Neil back there seems to have cost Monster the 2002 Heineken Cup. No doubt about it, that was the hand of back. Neil Back's personal assistant. Neil's left me a whole bunch of numbers of journalists he wants to attend the match on Saturday. Oh, right, yeah. I just need to confirm that you'd be able to pick up the tickets tomorrow, actually. Do you work for a newspaper? Yeah, I yeah, do. It's yeah. brief, or the journal. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, so listen, I'm just going to ask you to wait in here. So if you just want to take that seat there, that's great. Who are you with? Yeah, I forgot. It's not exactly what I was expecting. What were you expecting? A couple of free tickets, I'm walking out the door. OK, folks, we can just have some silence. Neil, are ready when you are? Good afternoon, everyone. Eamon, you just have your question there. Great, thank you. Sure. Uh, do you think the home advantage for Leinster will be uh, quite telling in the end? Sorry to bring it up, but uh, I'm going to have to ask about the leak of your phone number on Twitter. Do you care to give us a few examples of what kind of messages you got? Do you know what? I will. You know what yeah. I mean? Because they peed me off a bit. Back, you f***s. Never forget 2002. I would ask, how do you sleep at night? But you clearly don't, because the moonlight just bounces off your bald head. Does that sound familiar? Hmm? Was that you, was it? Why, why do you just send a text like that? <coughs> do you play rugby? Have you won many games? Um, in rugby, no. Well, today you have, because you're part of a wind-up. Would you won two... <laughs> I don't know how many times I've seen that video, but it's just, oh, every time that face when it drops, it's horrible. Um, that's sticking with the brief. And sometimes I think commercially when you get a brief, it's too easy to uh, believe that there are no different ways uh, to do things. We just, uh, we just heard the wonderful Izzy's Wheels on this stage talking about the development of their own business. 
and I was saying to them uh, backstage, I love the way they just threw out the 30 under 30 and Forbes and Vogue and Cosmo, and it's like, that's every day now for them. Um, they reinvented something. They didn't see it the way. Even though it's a really simple idea, they did something with passion. And I think sticking with the brief is often that for us. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. So, great creative thinkers. Alva from Izzy's Wheel said something interesting. She said she never thought of herself as a business person. And I think it's really important, the distinction between um, creatives, designers, technologists, and business people because I don't believe there is a distinction. Because if you are truly a gifted creative thinker of any description, then you owe it to yourself to earn a living from it. Because it's what your passion is, and it's possible to earn a living from it. There's lots of different disciplines that you can be in. It doesn't have to be any one particular thing. But in thinking about this, I believe that the three most important, th aside from talent, I'm taking talent as a given, three most important things are you need to be curious, you need to be resourceful and you need to be relentless. And in traditional terms, uh, the people who I set the business up with all those years ago, we wouldn't be thought of as creatives in traditional terms, but we think of ourselves as creatives. And I wanted to share this story with you um, to see if I demonstrated those three things. So many years ago, we were working with Waterford Crystal. Now, uh, I'm gonna explain this to the audience because you might not know what Waterford Crystal is. Crystal cut glass stuff. It used to be on shelves in houses um, and people would look at it and polish it and take it out once a year in the good room. That's pretty much what Waterford Crystal was. Um, it was a prestigious Irish band that uh, brand that traded in airports pretty much around the world. And they came to us and they wanted to boost their sales in every duty free around the planet. So what we decided to do was, when you bought a piece of Waterford Crystal, you got a villa vacation money off voucher. So you got, it was a big one, you got £250 at the time, money off a villa vacation when you booked through this particular co company. Wonderful. Everybody was delighted. We were expecting big things from the promotion. We printed 20,000 of the vouchers uh, because it was a high-end purchase, so we didn't think it was going to go any bigger than that. We distributed the vouchers around to every duty-free around the world. And then we found out that we had printed the wrong phone number on the voucher. That's exactly how I felt. There was this moment of sickness because we didn't know whose phone number it was. So the first thing we did was phone the phone number and this little old lady answered the phone number. It was horrifying. So then we decided we, we needed to figure out, we couldn't ask because she was clearly an old lady on the phone, so we didn't want to frighten her um, by asking, what's your address, clearly? So we went around the houses and because it's Ireland, we found somebody who worked in Aircom at the time and was able to tell us, we explained what the situation was, it was a family member uh, who worked in, in Aircom, explained what the situation was, they gave us the address of the, uh, the old lady. Myself and, uh, and one of my colleagues at the time, uh, who's as bold as me, drove his Ford Mondeo, I think special branch guards, out to Dunleary, uh, got out, and I knocked on the door sheepishly with a business card in my hand, and she opened the door, and I gave her the business card, and I said, look, we've done something, uh, we made a mistake with your phone number, have you any family close to you, or near, geographically near you? And she said, yeah, my daughter lives around the corner. I said, well, look, could we come back at two o'clock this afternoon and talk to you about the phone number and the mistake that we've made. And after you call her, would you mind taking your phone off the hook because you might get a lot of strange phone calls in the meantime. Anyway, thankfully she agreed to do it. So we went back at two o'clock. And at this point, the client didn't know a thing about this because that's what you do when you've got a small business and when you're trying to think of creatively how to keep that business afloat, because this could have been not only brand damaging, it could have put, a put us out of business if this had gone wrong. So I went back uh, to the house that afternoon and met with the daughter and the mum and explained, brought the, the voucher and explained uh, what we'd uh, done. And we managed with quite a, quite a large check at the time. Um, in fact, it was the cost of the overall promotion from our point of view um, to buy that lady's telephone number off her and get her a new telephone number. So we were able to leave the leaflets distributed all around the world, keep the telephone number. That lady got a very nice present on that day with a brand new phone number that was very memorable. And the reason I tell you that story is because I think that as, uh, as college students, 
Uh, we can often mistake the difference between a creative thinker and a creative doer and the practice of every day. Because if you are a genuine creative thinker, you're doing it every day. You're resourceful and relentless every day in whatever given project you're on. That's, for me, what creative thinking is. And um, I'd just like to wish you all the very best on this really exciting journey that you're on. I think it's a great time to be alive. You guys know more than old guys like me will ever do. Um, and I hope to see you all in the future doing amazing things. Thank you for listening.